Right. Okay. Cool. So I think the good place to start with bearded dragons is obviously uh, thermoregulation. So bearded dragons are renowned for their propensity to bask. So I thought it would be really apt to start with how they thermoregulate in the wild. Could you? You've described the time that you commonly find them basking as like beardy hour. Could you go into that a little bit for us? Yeah. So, um, so as you know, so bearded dragons, they're a basking species, what we call a heliothermic species. Um, so they need to bask, get their temperatures up to the preferred optimal body temperature so they can digest food, um, all the metabolism and everything like that. So where we actually find them, so it's an arid area, the nights can get quite cold and it's only really just in the peak of summer where the nighttime temperatures are still quite warm. Um, for example, in spring, it's early spring breeding season. Days will be getting anywhere between 27 and 30 degrees and that's when they really start coming out. Uh, but the night times are still five degrees. So it still gets quite cold for them. So when we go out, we'd usually drive along the roads and it's not until about, depending, 9.30 is when they start coming out to bath. Um, and that's their first bath. It's What actually happens is, is they've slowly warmed up as the air temperatures increased and once they've warmed up they'll move to actively basking in the sun but hidden and then once their body temperatures hit over about 26 degrees they'll actually go to a basking open exposed basking position and um actually if i show you a graph of all the basking temperatures of the dragons that we found um we can actually see what how this how this looks okay so we actually got even though this is can you see that graph on your screen yep so even though this looks like a whole scattering of uh temperatures with no real basking time but you can see the basking time from about nine o'clock it started there but this is all seasons that we found them so depending on whether in the warmer months, they came out earlier, and in uh, the cooler months, so late, uh, early spring or late autumn, they actually came out later as the air temperatures came up. They'd come out, and we'd have about a window of about an hour in the warmer months to about two hours uh, in the, the cooler months. And that's the time at which they would bask to get their body temperatures up to their preferred optimal body temperature. And they would bask for that period and once they got up to the right temperature they would either go off and hunt for food or if especially in springtime um the males would actually move to an area that wasn't uh didn't have as much sun or they would position their body to reduce the amount of sun on their body to prevent overheating because once it got to the middle of the day depending on what season the temperature air temperature got to the point where they didn't need to keep basking to keep their body temperatures high and but also at the same time they wouldn't want to have their body at a high temperature a preferred optimal body temperature um for the whole day because they want to conserve the higher the temperature the more metabolism they're chewing energy so they would actually go to a sheltered position um a shaded position and once the afternoon temperatures um started to drop again or have eaten some food during the middle parts of the day that actually come out again in the afternoon to bask again get an extra bit of heat continue digestion but also to keep some warmth throughout the night so do you think that they generally prefer cooler air temperatures than we give them credit for because i've noticed my bit of dragon she 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 comes and goes out of vivarium and she seeks cooler temperatures um than i would expect a lot of the time she'll go find some really cool in the corner sort of like like low low 20 22 sort of thing and go like camp out and just sit there she won't go to sleep so it's not like she's gone over somewhere and like got cold and then fell asleep she's just sitting somewhere cooler so when we have like our cool ends at like a minimum of like 30 degrees and things like that do you think they generally prefer quite cooler air temperatures yeah so we have to think of reptiles um 
especially this type of reptile, it lives in an arid zone. It's got limited food supply, limited water supply. These animals, they want to get to a preferred optimal body temperature to kickstart their metabolism for the day so that they're quick, they can escape predators, they can eat, um, they can digest. But if they don't have any food or there's no need to keep their body temperature high, they're going to move to an area that's cooler um, just because it's saving energy. Um, a lot of bearded dragons, they've come from an environment and there's two methods which reptiles will adapt to an arid environment. So there's behavioural. So they'll deal with the desert heat by hiding during the day. So some of your geckos and stuff like that um, in arid areas have adapted that way. And they'll, they'll hide during the hottest part of the day, but also during the heat of the day. Um, and a lot of the arid snakes as well, they'll actually do that. And then you've got other species which go, okay, I'm going to adjust my body temperature. So they have higher preferred optimal body temperatures to operate at and they'll adapt that way. They'll evolve that way. So they can last for longer hours out there, but that requires a lot more food. So bearded dragons have, central bearded dragons have adapted a bit of both in this situation. Their preferred optimal body temperature is over a degree higher than your coastal bearded dragons. So they've adapted that way. Um, but also when they're out there, we have them basking, but retreating in the hottest part of the day. We do have species of lizards, uh, Tenophorus nucullus, um, the central netted dragon, and your Tympanocryptus species, which will be out there when it's 45 degrees, 50 degrees. Their metabolism is so high, um, but they require a lot of food. So bearded dragons has hit the middle. So for them, they'll use the heat, but then they retreat during the, the middle part of the day and try to cool their bodies down to a certain level, preserve, because they don't have endless amounts of food um, and they're not an annual species. A lot of the species that have adapted to have the really high preferred optimal body temperatures in Australia are, are annual species, which will live and die within the same season. So um, it's bearded dragons. We They don't want to be at that high temperature the whole time. Um, and their instinct in them tells them to, okay, stay cool unless I eat then I need to increase my body temperature. I need to reproduce, increase my body temperature. So we do see dragons, like in clinical practice, a lot of keepers who keep their dragons hot the whole time, even the nighttime temperatures, the dragon will want to hide. It won't want to come out and bask in the morning because it's chewing up so much of its reserves, its instinct tells it to stay down, stay out of the heat because you're already chewing all that energy. So a lot of animals um, in captivity, you see them, they shouldn't be basking. In captivity, they should not be sitting underneath the basking lamp all day if you have the right temperatures. They should come out first thing in the morning, bask, and then after an hour, once they've warmed up, they can retreat somewhere else where it's a couple of these degrees cooler um, and then if they eat, they might eat and then come to bars. But it's a common thing in captivity, people thinking, oh, why isn't my dragon basking all the time? Stuff like that. Your dragon should only really be basking for a short period of time. And depending on the nighttime temperature, if you have warm nighttime temperatures, it will bask less because it doesn't need to raise. Like, as I was saying, in the springtime, the air temperatures are five degrees at night. Yeah, they're in burrows during that part of the year. Um, and so they'll get down to, you know, 11, 12 degrees. Um, they'll actually get most of the time get colder than their winter um, hibernation burrows, but they'll get quite cold. And that's why they come out um, in the springtime and they bask 
for so long because they've got to raise their temperatures from about 10 degrees to all the way up to 36.3, which is what we found the core body temperature of them to be. So, but in the summertime, nighttime temperatures, 27 degrees, they need to bask for, you know, 10, 20 minutes and then their temperatures are up and then they can go off and do what they want or they can go sit in the shade and survey their territory and um, look out for food and stuff like that. So, it's funny you mentioned 27 because that's literally the number that this room has been hitting some uh, some nights and she she really really basks um early in the morning she'll bask and then the rest of the day she'll just chill out and um, basically yeah. exactly what you describe yeah yeah it's yeah that it's it's something that we just need to be aware of like yeah it's okay to let them have a nighttime drop as long as you have the daytime temperatures appropriate um and that's not just a problem that people have with bearded dragons. I see it in people with pet snakes, people keeping snakes in racks. They keep them in a very narrow window of 28 degrees and 32 degrees. And they don't hit their preferred optimal body temperature, but they also, um, they don't get cold enough. So, and that's okay. People keep them successfully in that narrow band because the temperature that they're at and they get down to never stresses them. But if their temperature starts going down to 20 degrees at night and you only have 32 degree basking spot, that's when it all falls apart. An immune system that's been operating uh, subclinically sick gets tipped over the edge. So, um, you know, it's, I think this, there's a mentality within the reptile keeping community that all these animals, we can't let them get their nighttime temperatures low. But when you look at some of them in the wild, they will get down to 10, 12 degrees Celsius. But the amount of heat in the sun during the day is enough to get them. So their immune system switches on metabolically, they get switch on so they can deal with that. And that's the proper way which they've evolved to survive and live, not in a narrow set of range which, you know, it doesn't, yeah, sure, in the wild, they don't have the extremes because they can move and have that choice. But in our terrariums, some people stick them in this narrow range and that's it's not allowing them to go, okay, I need to switch my body off because that's what I've evolved to do and then during the day switch it back on. I think. That makes a lot of sense. So... In the past, you have described female bearded dragons like emerging after sunset, and I think a lot of people would be surprised by that. Why is it they emerge after sunset? So it's 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 really only in the breeding season. So when we talk about you know the bearded dragons that are coming out to bask in the morning, then the males will generally go bask at a high point that's shaded. Um, not use it, as little energy as possible and survey the area. The females will often go off and feed if they can and then bask some more during the day. But then in the afternoon, when the temperatures come back down, as we're getting towards dusk, temperatures start dropping. The radiant heat decreases. Obviously, the sun's going down. And out in where they are, um, termites is a major protein for them, animal protein for them. Um, and the females will actually eat, uh, in the afternoon, large amounts of termites. And then to digest that for breeding, for incubating eggs, they'll go back out onto the roads, um, and they'll come out and we see them on the roads. So this is usually around 6, 7 p.m. Um, after the sun has actually gone down and there's actually no radiant heat at all, um, they'll be on the roads basking. They'll be on the sides of the roads or a surface that's warm. Um, and when we first started taking temperatures of these animals, um, we were taking temperatures on the top of them and it's like 23, 24 degrees. But then when you flip them and you measure the, bas the, the belly temperature, it's up around 36 degrees. So they're absorbing quite a lot of heat from their, their bellies. So, um, and that's why we see a lot of the females coming out after dusk, um, do that because 
at that time of year. Um, as I said before, Central Bearded Dragons, how they differentiated themselves, they needed the heat in spring to be able to reproduce. And that's what they're doing. They're grabbing as much heat as they can because they're a boom or bust species. They're an arid species. If times are good, there's heat available, let's breed it, and food available, let's breed as much as we can. So they're obviously using th- thigmothermy as well as heliothermy in the wild as well, then? Yeah. So in the wild, they're definitely using thigmothermy. Um, the thing is, is like we don't see males doing that at all. They don't need it. Um, and, you know, as much as, but just showing you how less effective it is than their radiant heat is that when we were taking temperatures of them, the temperatures on their backs and the rest of their body was so much lower than the temperature on their belly. So even though they are using thigmothermy and a lot of the species in Australia that do use thigmothermy um, that we see is it's during the hottest part of the year, the hot nights and stuff like that. There is no way an animal, um, most of them would be able to get enough heat. There's just too much bulk to them to get thigmothermy on a road um, after dusk. It's always during the hottest parts of the year that they'll just get that extra bit to keep going. And we see that in a lot of other species in Australia, like diamond pythons, for example. Um, you see them in the winter time; they'll actually become diurnal using radiant heat. But in the winter time, uh, in the summertime, they go nocturnal and they can use the heat off the road because the nighttime air temperatures are so high. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not, they do do it, but they're, it's not as effective for them as, uh, heliothermy, as in basking. So, yeah. Um, do they use their bellies to cool down as well? So, um, we saw it in, Two cases, um, and it's also documented in uh, the Batam paper that they'll actually use their bellies to cool down. Um, so when we talk about basking, so basking or being exposed is not just for thermoregulation, not just for heating themselves up. Um, it's to obviously be out exposed, so especially in bearded dragons, so another male, especially the males can see them, um, they can survey, they can have a vantage point for getting to food and stuff like that. So when they're exposed, especially in spring, when the temperatures start getting really high, um, so we, we did witness one dragon that we must have just missed its combat point, but they were exposed combating in the full sun. And we saw one of the males go off and he just went into a cool area underneath a shaded area and just lay flat out on the cold sand. So in the springtime, in the sun, the sand exposed by about 11 a.m., it will be, you know, 40 degrees on the sand, 50 degrees. But if it's been shaded, that sand still has a lot of thermal mass and it'll be 25, 24 degrees in that cooler area or even colder if the night's been really cold. So they do use that to cool themselves down, pull some heat out of them. So, yeah, so. It just goes to show how thermally diverse their environment is and how like diverse their thermoregulation behavior is, not just like bask or not sort of thing. Yeah. And there's, and that's the thing, like when we, when we look at their, um, their environment, it's, when we put them in a box, we kind of limit what's available to them. And this is one of, I guess that's one of one of the things with um, reptile keeping is that you've got to try and get their whole environment and their what they have available, all their little microclimates, and you have to try and fit it into a box for them. Um, when we look at them in the wild, they can go from the shade of a tree where the air temperature is 24 degrees, the ground that they're on can be 18, 19 degrees, but then they can shift 10 centimetres to the right and that's full sun and the ground's already 50 degrees there. So 
they have all this stuff available and that's what we've got to try and I guess to somewhat mimic in a terrarium we don't need it 50 degrees because we know they're not going to use that 50 degrees but we do need to have that temperature of a uh, higher temperatures available so they can get that heat but also if they don't want it they can go somewhere else so um, it's about giving them options and without stressing them at the extremes as well but, which they would never choose in the world I think you've already touched on it. You've basically just described it, but I wanted to go over the term biphasic basking. Could you just uh, like define it a little bit for the viewers for us? So biphasic, so bi means two and phasic is phases, two phase basking. So what we see is they come out in the morning for a few hours to bask and then they retreat during the hottest part of the day once they've got up to temperature and then once the temperatures drop again in the afternoon or they've been feeding they'll come back again and bask until um late in the afternoon where the temperature gets cool enough where they'll retreat to burrows um or they'll retreat to um their nighttime resting place so even though they have burrows a lot of the time especially during the warmer parts of the year, they'll actually sleep on bushes, logs, sleep in a tree type thing rather than sleeping in the burrows. They generally just use the burrows for the earliest parts of um, spring where the nighttime's still cold or the latest part of autumn. So obviously they're basking, they're using like really hot basking spots. How does basking play a role in like parasite management in the wild? So, as generally, reptiles, we know they're cold blooded ectothermic animals. They rely on the sun or the, the result of the sun heating up the environment to, for their metabolism. So, we see them, uh, a dragon, when it gets its body up to a preferred optimal body temperature, that's when everything is firing its metabolism is at its peak digestion would be at its peak um, everything is working as it's evolved and having those temperatures at, so it can get high enough to get its metabolism up that means its immune systems at a hundred percent a problem that we have in captivity is we have people not keeping the basking spots hot enough. And when, and this is amongst all reptiles, when the amount of heat available for the reptile is not hot enough, then their immune system drops. And that gives the parasites an opportunity to take over. Pathology, disease, relies on three factors. It's the host, the environment, and the pathogen. Um, interaction. So if we have a host super strong, then it's got its best chance. It's environment. So in a bearded dragon, so it's getting enough food, it's getting its right temperatures and everything like that. And then you've got your pathogen. So, um, you know, whether it's worms, um, or for example, a recent example, if we, Talk about humans, COVID, stuff like that. And it depends on how pathogenic that pathogen is, how easily it can make them sick. So, and that's a balance that every animal exists and human exists in that state. And if you affect any of that to a certain point, the chance of disease comes upon it. So, um, having an animal that's not basking at its preferred optimal body temperature, its immune system is not working properly. And then that gives the opportunity for if something in the environment goes wrong, it's too wet or it's all the pathogen. So the worm can then go, okay, the parasite can go, okay, immune system's down. I have an advantage here to reproduce and take over and take advantage. So um, that's how the basking temperatures uh, affect parasite control, but also 
we're finding with a lot of especially Australian reptiles don't particularly call we don't they don't when they brew mate they don't totally switch off they still come out during the winter um to bark if it's warm enough and we actually do see this in bearded dragons as well if the daytime temperatures are around 27 degrees in the winter they'll still come out and bask and that is the animal coming on switching on its metabolism switching on its immune system just to help keep things in check keeping its immune system up um and that's what we see in a lot of the species um in australia even in the winter even some of the snakes coming out during the winter still basking trying to get their bodies warm enough so they can control parasites um but go on yeah that makes a lot of sense so we you we went into a little bit of like you've got a lot of surface temperature data for what they've basked in in the wild based upon everything that you've experienced what would you recommend as a surface temperature for a basking spot in captivity so this is this is a really hard thing to answer because on doing it we realized that um i'll get it up share my screen oh here we go that's some females sitting after dusk on the road on the sides of the road basking and that's for the bellies that's for the belly heat so it's it does happen and that's a nice good image of what what they're doing there but so this is the substrate temperature and most of the time here we're seeing a lot of the temperatures around between the 30 and 40, then we've got quite a few temperatures above. And then the hottest one, um, this was 65 degrees on a big male in springtime on the middle of the road. We don't know what he was doing on the middle of the road. We just came across him. We suspect he was not actually thermoregulating. Um, he was actually displaying to another male. That's what we think is going on there. Um, but the problem even though we got a lot of substrate surface, it's all different surfaces. It's wood, um, it's sand, bitumen, if we got them on a bit of bitumen road, um, or some of them we got off the tops of bushes or fence posts as well. So the problem with so many varied substrates is that they all have different thermal masses. So for example we got to an area um there was an area that we'd go it was a ridge um that we used to go and find when i say a ridge it's in the desert so it's just a little hill and they had these big um kind of marble rocks sitting there and every dragon that we took off them um the temperatures were still around 20 degrees even though it was in the afternoon because they just had so much thermal mass, but the dragons that were sitting on them were 10, 15 degrees higher. And I don't, I'm not convinced that this is the best way to determine the temperature of a basking site. If you, because I could say, yeah, it's best to be at 42, but it depends whether it's slate or it depends whether it's a piece of wood. Um, so um, there are different ways to measure it. Um, what we can get from it, though, when pairing it with the bearded dragon temperatures, where we actually took the temperature off the back of the bearded dragon, is that these bearded dragons can have a lot better at absorbing radiant heat than the um, surface around them they do it a lot more rapidly um and you know providing around on a ro rock if you've got peak temperatures around 42 degrees that bearded dragon could definitely get to its preferred optimal body temperature i would more likely say to an owner is to measure when your bearded dragon is basking and measure with a laser thermometer 
the surface of the bearded dragon's back and get it. So it is definitely getting up to about 38 or 40 degrees. Um, we found that their off, so their preferred optimal body temperature, their core body temperature is 36.3. That's what our study found. And that's what Badham's study found, which was over 50 years ago. They found the exact same temperature. And the reason why we want to have higher temperatures, and this is all reptiles. If you have an animal that has a preferred optimal body temperature, you need to have a basking source that will provide heat warmer than that because it's got to go through the animal. The animal, it's, you know, it has to be gaining heat faster than it's losing it out the other bits out of its belly and stuff like that. And this is a principle that, that I see in clinical practice where people go, Oh, but they only like to be 29, 30 degrees. And it's like, yeah, but when you have an animal that's this big, and you only have, it wants its whole body to be 29 or 30 degrees and you provide it 30 degrees. It's never going to get to 30 degrees inside its body. So that's why it's important. Even though their preferred optimal body temperature is 36.3, you need to have the, the basking amount of basking energy and basking temperatures for their skin to get several degrees higher. So their core body temperature can get to that preferred optimal body temperature. So. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Now, question, do we dare go into power density? <laughs> power density. This is, so I guess for those people that don't know what we're talking about, power density is the amount of energy in the sun's rays. That's UV rays, visible light rays, and infrared rays. Um, and it's been something that is talked about quite recently on the um, Advancing Herpetological Husbandry page and the Reptile Louding page. And this answers our what temperature should our substrate be at, how much wattage should the lamp be at. This is something that when I looked at, okay, we're going to measure the, bar the basking spot temperature of the beta dragons, and it just didn't line up. You know, because there were so many different surfaces, we needed something where it didn't rely on the object being heated that we could uniformly say, this is how much we need. Um, I did not, my study was before we even thought, before, um, this concept of power density use even came up. So I don't even actually have power density reading for these animals. Um, but. I'm using it now and I, I can't, honestly, I cannot give you a range of what power density should be at. at. Um, for example, I got behind me, I got my, um, I got a chameleon and it's power density, um, underneath a halogen lamp, the UV lamp and, uh, LED, um, visible light spotlight is power density is at 400 watts per square meter and i stick my hand underneath that or my forearm and i can honestly say it's nowhere near what the burning sensation when i'm catching those bearded dragons out in the wild that are basking so we need to yeah it'd be good to get some readings um but then we also need to look at what do they actually need to get that body temperature up to the correct point? Because there's, in this day and age, you don't want to be pumping excess energy if it's not needed in there. And it is somewhat determined, as I said before, season, how low the nighttime temperature gets. If it's a lower nighttime temperature, for them to get up to an adequate preferred optimal body temperature is going to take a lot more power than if they're at higher overnight temperatures and to raise it um fewer degrees so at this stage uh, power density is not something that um I, I can confidently recommend um at the moment i can recommend 
skin surface temperatures with a laser thermometer off the back of a bearded dragon, which I would say is 40 to 42 degrees. Because I would feel comfortable in your captive setting. If you kept them in a basement where nighttime temperatures were 12 degrees, um, and then during the day you wanted to heat them, you'd want that bearded dragon skin temperature to be getting up around 42 to 45 degrees if it was that cold. Yeah, power desk is a very new thing. So for beginners watching, they're like, what? Don't worry. It's, it's, it's the sort of thing that like the next five to ten years is going to be a mainstream thing. It, but for now, it'll it's come. like, yeah. yeah. It'll definitely come. And I think it's, you know, in the last five years, people just started to get their head around UV index. So, um, you know, so we're about to, we've, once we've got that under control, power density, and I think... I, I know it's going to be the way to to go forward and say this is how much energy we need, um, rather than going oh yeah just stick an ominous lamp and measure that piece of wood, piece of whatever that's sitting underneath it, or air temperatures. Yeah, that's- the clip you've just watched is just a snippet of a larger podcast episode where we had Beardivet on the podcast. If you want to find the full podcast episode, you can find that up here. Or if you want to carry on looking through the Beedivet Explained series, you can find the rest of it down here.